2 Corinthians 11. If there's a lie out there, you know the devil took credit for it. He invented it. He's the father of lies. He's the original liar. There's no, he mixes, I was going to say there's no truth in him, but he mixes truth and lies. Or, he's like the master of isolating scripture to make it sound like what he wants it to sound like. Let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> Let's see here. Let's look in. Turn your Bible to Luke 4. Luke 4. Then we'll go to 2 Corinthians 11. Give you an example of um, Satan bringing in little bits of Scripture that... He isolates from every, and just to prove his point, uh, in Luke chapter 4, this is Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, and um, <clears throat> it says in, uh, let's pick it up in verse 9, Luke chapter 4, he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee. To keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And then he stops quoting scripture. It says in verse 12, Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the, when the devil had ended all the temptations, he departed from him for a season. That quotation in verse 10, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, is from Psalm 91. So turn to Psalm 91. And let's get, let's get the whole deal here of what uh, the Bible actually says. And you'll understand that there's parts of it the devil just conspicuously left out. In Psalm 91, the Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Behold, thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And here it is in verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So the, and the devil stops reading right there. Stops quoting it. If you look at the very next verse, what does it say? Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. He didn't read that part. The part about he shall tread the dragon under feet. Because Satan's the dragon. And he conspicuously left that part of it out. In verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. And um, verse 14 really is the key to God's, God's order of protection over us, sending angels, to, and I believe this, I believe that there are angels that minister around us and give us protection. If you've ever been in a near-death situation or in a close call, like it's something that uh, should have turned into a bad car accident that didn't, or whatever, if you've ever had anything like that, I believe that that was God's angels having charge over thee. God's angels working to protect you, to keep your life. And um, I keep this in my mind now. I never forget it. Mike Hutzel was telling me this a couple weeks ago. He came to visit, and we were talking about our plans for Kenya. And we were both talking about how nervous we were about going over there. And my deal is... 
once I get over there, usually I get pretty nervous. His deal is being 50,000 feet in the air over the ocean. And uh, so anyway, he said that he had heard a pastor friend of ours preach this the other day. He said, God, he said, you are immortal until God is done with you on this earth. Meaning, you will not die until God is done using you. The devil cannot kill you. He cannot take you before it's time. So, the day that you die is the day that God had it written down. I'm done with him. On this date, at this time, I'm done. But, I would say, even after your death, if you sowed seeds of goodness and sowed seeds of God's word in this world, even after your death, those seeds are going to produce fruit, the fruit of your life long after you're dead. I believe in that. So anyway, the idea is because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. That's the cause right there. That's why God protects you is because you set your love upon him. The devil was not going to read that part because obviously Christ's love for his father was manifest. He did what his father told him to do. His love for us was manifest. He went to the cross and uh, that's, why, that's why God protected him. The devil will always, and keep this in your mind, the false prophets and the false teachers love to isolate little bits of scripture to make them say what they wanted to say, but you must always, here's the Apostle Paul saying it this way, walk circumspectly. Circum means a circle. Spect is what you see with your eyes. Look around. If somebody gives you a verse, take that verse, go back to where it came from, read what came before it, what, read what comes after it, Find out what's being said in that whole deal. Match it up with the context of the entire scripture. Because scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be, scripture does not uh, contradict other scripture. And so, don't let anybody try to convince you of some false doctrine by isolating one little thing out of scripture. Alright, that's just one of the tools of the devil. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 10, I have that up on the screen. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting uh, in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Verse 13, for such are false apostles. They want occasion. They want to be lifted up. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I want to pick up uh, in my notes here. Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 8. We're looking at things that are false. And um, in, the, in the light of the scriptures, what does God say about things that are false? The devil, like I said earlier, there's never a lie that the devil won't take credit for. He is the father of lies. He is the original liar, the original deceiver. And um, when he approached Adam and Eve, or Eve, in the Garden of Eden, he lied. He Questions the authenticity of God's word, yea, as God said. He directly contradicts God's word. When God said, you shall surely die, Satan said, you shall not surely die. In other words, you might just get away with this. Try it. Okay? Now, I think Satan knows the truth here. I think he gets it. But he's not going to tell the truth. He's going to tell his version of it. You shall not surely die. Then he offers a replacement. Once he, is, once he has destroyed the authority of God's word in your life and in your mind, he offers the replacement. 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, you should be as gods, knowing good and evil. So anything that's false, anything that's a lie, anything that's deceit, he's the father of it. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 17. Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath. A false oath, for all these things that, uh, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. A false oath is an oath that is taken when in your mind you know that you have no intention of keeping that oath. It's like Obama or Bill Clinton or whoever putting their hand on a Bible and swearing an oath. Those guys don't believe the Bible. They don't believe in the authority of scriptures. They don't believe the Bible's God's word. They have no respect for it whatsoever. And they never intended to protect the Constitution of the, United, of the United States. That wasn't their intention. Their intention was to get by with whatever they could get by with. If it happens to destroy little pieces of the Constitution or go against the Constitution, what is that to them? They swore a false oath they swore it somebody who gets on the witness stand is usually asked to swear or affirm that what they're going to say is the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth some places still put in so help you god some places have omitted that but it doesn't matter if you're going to lie if you're if you intend to lie putting god into it will not keep you from it they're going to lie no matter even if they even if they swore, so help me God, even if they swore that, they still have it as their intention to lie. When someone lies on the witness stand, it is in an attempt to deceive a judge or a jury to win a case one side or the other. There are cops who have lied on the witness stand, knowingly lied on the witness stand, in order to win a case, I guess for the prosecution, there are people who have deliberately lied on a witness stand in order to try to get somebody who is guilt, who has been tried for something in order to try to get that case thrown out or to be found not guilty or whatsoever. Defense attorneys, prosecutors, none of them are above swearing a false oath and lying about it. We have judges. All over the country. I'm not saying that every judge is corrupt. I do not believe that. I do believe that there are some judges that are ideologues and they have an agenda in their mind and they're going to push that agenda no matter what, whether that's a conservative or liberal agenda. And but for the most part, they're going to they're going to do what's right. They're going to do what they swore an oath to. But there are some judges in this country that have swore an oath and yet they have no intention of fulfilling that oath or obligation. They're going to lie. They're going to they're going to do things. There was I read an article the other day uh, and I didn't know this, but apparently an NBA referee was arrested found guilty of fixing NBA games. He was betting on NBA games. He was betting through a third party. He would have somebody, he would give the money to somebody and say, such and such team, I'm going to be that ref that night. I promise you that team's going to win. And what they did, they went back through the records and found that 80% of the bets that he made on NBA teams turned out in his favor. So he would get about $2,000 for every game that he fixed through the people that he was given money to to bet on and he was fixing the game he was calling fouls on teams uh, that he was against or letting fouls go on teams that he wasn't against he was fixing the games and he wrote he testified it isn't just me doing it he knew for a fact okay now I like sports I I like to think that there is integrity in sports, but we know that that's not always the case. It is a shame. People swear, and why do they do it? The love of money is still the root of all evil. Why would a team deliberately lose in a playoff 
just to play another game because they're going to get paid more for that other game. Okay? I'm not saying they all do it. I'm just saying it's got to go on because people love money than they love more than they love anything else. And a good name, the Bible says, is rather to be chosen than great riches. Amen? Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath. Malachi chapter 3, turn there. Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. God said, I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. That's those who practice witchcraft, Wicca, wizardry, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, any of these other books, fantasy role-playing games, computer games where you place the part of a sorcerer or whatever. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers. A false swearer. When two people are joined together in marriage, they give an oath to one another. They, they say that they're going to be loyal, faithful, true, good to the last drop, or whatever. They swear that. Some people keep that oath. Some people do not. God hates and he is against false swearers. And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. The widow and the fatherless that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm going to throw this in. I want you to look at this verse. Is God against those who swear a false oath? Yes. Is God against those who oppress workers in their wages? So it, it, what I'm asking is, is God for a man earning his labor, the fruit of his labor? Okay, I believe in that. The servant is worthy of his hire. Okay, anybody who works, and if they work hard, and they do a good job, and the company needs them, and on and on and on, they are worthy of a good wage, worthy of that. God is against people who oppress workers in their wages. Okay? I'm just going to throw this out there. We have, there's a lot of corruption everywhere in this world, and it's in the workplace as well. Number one, it's wrong for a worker to steal from their employer either time or resources or money or whatever. That's wrong. It is also wrong for an employer to oppress their workers. Let God be your agent. Let God be your agent. Okay? There's, I'm running through a list of things in my mind that I think will make what I say safe. All right? I don't want to make anybody mad, but sometimes unions don't do right. Sometimes they don't, okay? And if their practices, if their practices are against Scripture, you shouldn't have anything to do with it, okay? You should not have anything to do with that. Now, I'm not in the union. Thank God there are no preacher unions, okay? But, and I know I, I'm, I'm for everybody earning a wage, earning a good living. I'm all for that. If you work in a shop that's a union shop, work in that union shop, okay? But some of their practices are not right scripturally. You shouldn't have anything to do with that. It is better for you to lose a job for doing right than for you to keep a job and do wrong in that job. Union or not, it's better for you to lose a job doing right. Okay, I'm not going to get into, I got stories, I've seen things, I'm not going to get into that, I'm just telling you, if you believe this Bible, 
then you know that God is against anybody who tries to hurt you as a worker to oppress you in your wages. You know that. Having known that, let God give you the wages. Let God work out your situation. Amen. Those that oppress the widow and the fatherless. Okay? Catholic Church still goes around to widows. Right after an old man dies, they'll go to their widow, they'll go to their sons and say, your daddy's in, he's in purgatory. We need to get him out of there. Now, it's going to cost quite a bit of money because we have to do, we have to say masses. Listen, they still do that. They still do that, people. They still go after widows' houses. Anytime some old guy dies, they go right for the widow. They go right to their children. Say, oh, your daddy, he's, he's in purgatory. We need to get him out of there. It's going to cost quite a bit. Still happens. And God is against every bit of it. Amen? Okay. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets, things that are false. False prophets never come in wolves' apparel. They never come as a, they never appear as a false prophet. They appear as sheep. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Beware of them. By the way, masons wear sheep's clothing. The lambskin apron is a sheep's clothing. And they wear that, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Okay? You shall know them by their what? By their fruits. Thank you, Wayne, for correcting yourself there. I get it wrong too every now and then. You shall know them by their fruits. Same thing, same thing. Uh, New Watchman's coming out today, The Seed, part two. And I reference this in that Watchman. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? It's in the seed. Whatever, whatever shows up, you know that it was in the seed to begin with. If them stupid dandelions show up in your yard, it wasn't the fescue seed that you threw out there that did that. It wasn't the Kentucky bluegrass or whatever it is. Whatever grass seed you sowed out in your yard, it wasn't the seed's fault that dandelions sprung up in your grass, in your yard. It's because of the seed that was in that ground. I talk about my flower garden. I am still picking out of that flower garden, little bitty, I don't know what they are, but they got thorns all over them, stickers all over them. And I'm still pulling them out. And I've been doing that for years. And I'm going, God, how many of these things are there? And why don't they show up all at once? Okay? No, they don't show up all at once. They show up about 20 at a time. I pull them out. A couple of weeks later, there's some more of them. But you know that when thorns come up, that it's because the seed was sown. You know that when an apple tree produces apples, it's because the seed was sown. Whatever is manifested in somebody's life, it's not because of good seed. If some evil things manifested in somebody's life, that's not God's fault. That's not the Bible's fault. That's the seed that was sown in that person's life. Okay? And you will spend, listen to me, you will spend a lifetime pulling thorns out. They're not all going to show up on the same day. They're not all, all going to manifest all at once. But you are going to spend a lifetime because the devil sowed thorns in your life and you're going to have to get them out of there. That's your work. That's your labor. That's your responsibility. 
Even so, verse 17, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree cannot bring forth evil. But a, yeah, here we go. Sorry, read that wrong. But a corrupt tree, see Wayne, I go wrong too. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. This guy that uh, was arguing with me up there in Fargo about his NIV Bible, he said, well, King James is just as bad. I'm going, what? He said, you got people all over the world using the King James for uh, and teaching false doctrine. I, and I said, I'm going to tell you something. There are no false doctrines in the King James Bible. Just because somebody twisted scripture or somebody taught something false and isolated some little verse of scripture in order to do it, the, the source of their false doctrine was not the good seed of God's word. Cannot be. Amen. Cannot be. Amen. The source of false doctrine is always the seed that sowed it. You can't blame that on God and you cannot blame that on the Bible. The Mormons use a King James Bible. But their Book of Mormon trumps the King James in every way, in any place where the Book of Mormon disagrees with King James, the Book of Mormon wins in their mind every single time. It's not the Bible's fault. The Bible says it right in every place and in every way. But men of corrupt minds will corrupt the Word of God. So you cannot blame that on the Bible. Verse 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Turn to um, Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians, it's the ninth book of the New Testament. And there are nine fruits of the Spirit here. What does the number nine mean? Fruit bearing. A woman carries a baby nine months. Sarah was 90 years old when she brought forth fruit. By the way, the phrase Holy Ghost is mentioned 90 times in your Bible exactly. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit in verse 22, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Nine things exactly. Every sermon that I preach, every Sunday school lesson, every Wednesday night, Sunday night, Every pastor mic online, every watchman, every video I make, every teaching I make, it is my joy to sow the seed of the Word of God in you. Because I want to see in your life love. Love for God, love for God's people, love for the Word, a love for righteousness, a love for truth, a love to love sinners the way Jesus loves sinners. Amen? To love lost people the way Jesus loved lost people. That's what I want to see in your life. I want to see that fruit. I want to see joy in your life. And I mean real joy. And I'm not talking about having a little laughing experience every now and then. Joy is not laughing at a funny joke. Joy is an inward thing that God puts in you that you are happy in the Lord even in the storms of life. I've seen these fake, phony Christians who walk around with a little fake smile on their mouth all the time. They have been taught that they, if they say positive things and have a positive face and have a positive attitude, then positive things will happen in their life. That's not true. That's not true. That's witchcraft's what that is. Okay? That's the idea that if you, if you, speak, ne positive, if you speak negative things, then negative things are going to happen. Tim Barron's was right. He was going to ask Joel Osteen at Joel Osteen's church in front of everybody, how come you don't preach on hell? He was going to ask him that. And the Holy Ghost shut him up. But you'll never hear Joel Osteen preach on hell. Do you know why? He believes that if he says hell and preaches on hell, 
then that's going to curse people and they're going to go to hell. They're already cursed, you idiot. They're already going. Warn them. Amen. But anyway, a real joy in your life, manifested in your life, not something fake, but real joy. I would love to see peace. Do you have peace with God? Do you have peace within your own heart, knowing your sins forgiven? Do you have long suffering? Are you able to long suffer with people and forbear with people? Whereas before you had a quick temper, you had a hot temper. Gentleness. Are you gentle with people? Are you gentle with family members? Are you gentle with your husband or your wife? Are you gentle with your children? Are you gentle with your neighbor? Are, or do you just, you just go about trying to get, make everybody pay for their, what you perceive as their wrongdoing? Do you have genuine goodness in your life? Do you have faith? Uh, faith is a fruit of the Spirit. But it's faith that brings forth that fruit. Okay? And, and if you have a problem with that, think of the seed that planted, is planted in the ground and an apple tree comes up and it produces apples with seeds in it that when they're planted in the ground, a tree comes up and they produce apples with seeds in it and then they fall. And it just, it's in cycles, isn't it? Okay? And that's how it is. Faith produces faith. But little faith, one seed of faith, how many apples can grow on a tree in a season? A lot. And how many seeds are in each one of those apples? You see, one little thing of faith in your life can be manifested into multitudes of faith. You start out believing John 3, 16, and then that seed going in your life, all of a sudden you're starting to believe things in the Bible you never believed before. That's how it works. This is what God does in your life. Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. These things in your life, in that same chapter, if you look at verse 18, but if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If these things are manifest in your life, then this next list here will not be manifested in your life. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. I, four things that the shame of it is, these are what's being manifested out of most church people nowadays. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's the shame of it. Idolatry, witchcraft, there it is right there. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. One of the worst murder cases in this area was out of a couple of church members. A woman who was, and I knew her, a woman who was, her and her husband were like the youth ministers at their church. She was sleeping with about half the guys in that church. And she wanted her husband killed, so she hired one of her boyfriends in that church to shoot and kill her husband, and he did it. And when they caught up with him, they said, why did you do this? And then he pinned her. And they both did time for murder. Okay? This made big headlines all over the country. And I know at least one of the persons involved. And they were church people. That's the shame of it. Amen? Wrath envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he gives, he said, there's 18 things here. That's nine multiplied by two. If you will manifest, if the fruit of the Spirit will be manifested in your life, then these other things will not be. Okay? And false teachers, false prophets, false workers, false seed... Corrupt seed brings forth corrupt fruit, and it does it every single time. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. And, and uh, turn to Matthew 13. Boy, I hear, I'm giving you the Watchman broadcast. Sunday school, I'm giving you the preview of it. In Matthew 13, you have the parable of the uh, wheat and the tares. And... Um, In, let's see, Matthew 13, verse 38. 
The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the Son in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The harvest is always a transformation. Something being changed or transformed. That's why when you're looking at the wheat and the tares and both stalks are green, it is difficult to tell the difference. And so God the husbandman says we're going to wait. We're going to let them both grow together. And then at the harvest, we're going to know who is and who isn't. Because the wheat turns golden like the sun. That's what he said. The righteous shall shine as uh, shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father we're going to bear the image of christ who is the son of righteousness and yet the tares they turn black like darkness like evil like sin like stains and at at the harvest when the fruit is manifested then ye shall know them by their fruits and at some point in a person's life all you have to do is wait to see the fruit that's manifested. This is why the Bible will tell you not to make hasty decisions. Do not just jump into things. Wait. Get to know people. Get to know people that you're going to associate with. Get to know people that you're going to be in business with. Get to know people that you are considering marrying them. Get to know people that you're considering having any kind of friendship relationship with them. People show up want to be your friend on facebook and all oh, that looks great oh look at how many friends i got on facebook and then three months later you find out who they really are cut them off because they're not really your friends because they manifested the fruit of who they really are in their life and you have to say i can't have anything to do with that i can't go with that i see people every time i get on facebook i'm seeing somebody I cleaned out my friend's lift. If you're reading this, you made the cut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I'm glad for that. <laughs> God hates things that are false. False friends are one of them. False friends are one of them. Give people time to manifest. There are people, I know the bell rang, I'll say this. There are people will contact me and they'll say pastor we've been watching you for a year a couple that came visited us a couple weeks ago john and bunny hi john bunny i love them they're sweet people but they said we've been watching you for a while we saw one thing you did that sounds good let's watch this guy they're waiting to see what comes out of my mouth they're waiting to see what's what's really in my heart okay they're waiting to see whether or not because they know down deep in their heart that even wolves can sound like sheep for a little while and there's so many people out there and maybe you here that have been burnt by false teachers false prophets false preachers stupid churches and you're caught you're more cautious now than you ever have been and you're waiting you're doing that's wisdom wait till the fruits are manifested then ye shall know them amen? amen father in heaven give us wisdom give us wisdom father help us to see things the way they really are help us dear god to to have understanding enough lord to to know the difference between good seed and corrupt seed, good fruit and corrupt fruit. Father, so many of us in life have been burned by people, had friendships and relationships destroyed because we found out who they really were. Marriages have been destroyed. Homes have been destroyed. Neighborhoods and relationships and people, Lord, and lives have been destroyed because we've been deceived. Faith has been destroyed by wolves in sheep's clothing. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would protect us, that you give us grace, manifest, Father, wisdom in our lives to help us to see 
what's right and what's not. Thank you, Lord, for this book that teaches us that wisdom. Bless it, Lord, today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.